And this morning, we're quasi beginning a new series <laughs> in the book of Jude. And I say quasi because I, I, I want to wrestle with a paradox a little bit before we, we launch into Jude, and I think it's all tied together. Um, but you can certainly turn to the book of Jude uh, right before Revelation and put your finger in there. And for the month of, of March, we're going to be going through the book of Jude. It's one of those books that gets uh, neglected often, it gets overlooked often. And uh, what it does is it kind of makes us functional um, errantists, um, if I can make up that phrase. But, but when we believe that Scripture is an errant, or when we believe it's authoritative, when we believe Scripture is the Word of God, we're basically making a claim about it that says all of it, the whole counsel of God is important and necessary. That if God superintended, there's another big word for you, but if God superintended or oversaw the compilation of the scriptures for his people, then the things that are in scripture have a relevancy to us. And Jude is one of those books, like much of the Old Testament, that kind of gets neglected in the church. And I think we do that at our own peril uh, because we leave out things that could inform, uh, challenge, or speak to our faith, um, or that God intended to inform, challenge, or speak to our faith. So it's going to be fun going through the book of Jude. But here's the paradox a little bit. The name Antioch, we took the name Antioch for a very specific reason. If you turn to Acts chapter 11, you can kind of see a little bit about the church at Antioch and the beginning of kind of why we took the name. But you see, um, for the first time in the, the history of the church, that the message is intentionally being brought to outsiders. Okay, and, and I say intentionally um, here in a, in a very specific way because Peter had gone to the centurion's house because God had given him a dream and then sent messengers and basically called him there. And, and you had a, an evangelist, Philip, talk to an Ethiopian. But God had been kind of, kind of um, creating these serendipitous or forced meetings, if you will, so that the gospel or the good news would go beyond just the insiders, just beyond um, the Jewish folk from Jerusalem who had been witnesses of the events of Jesus. And, and God has been doing this, but then you kind of get in chapter 11 of the book of Acts some people that I think really understand the heart of the gospel message, and it says this beginning in verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. And some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So the first time you see in the New Testament era an intentional taking of the message of Jesus to others, that it's not just about me or about us, my clan or my tribe or my ethnic group. It's, it's not just about the insiders or the people that I would have in some sense um, an affinity with. It's not just about my affinity group. This is for everybody. This is for people who are lost. This is for people who are desperately trying to search out the God of the universe and know that he loves them and has a relationship, um, desires a relationship with them and has, has created this plan so that they could be brought near. And, and so these people get the good news because that's really good news, isn't it? And they begin to go, it's not just about us being on the receiving end. It's about us being the, deliver, the, the deliverers or the conduits of this message to other people. And I think we always tend to fall into, naturally, fall into the, to the, the mode of operating with our faith that it really is about us or our affinity group. We naturally kind of fall into that. We see Jesus with the Pharisees saying, is it really love if you just love the people that love you back? I mean, is that really love? And you see Jesus pushing into that. And I think... Um, the songs we sing, I love the song Amazing Grace, but I think what we do with it is, is concerning to me. We, we stand at, at the long end of a funnel and, and we, we, we just revel in the grace that's all kind of rushing down to us as if that's where it ends. Does that make sense? That's the part that I don't, I mean, the song's great, 
But the fact that we're at the bottom of the funnel and it, and it all ends with me, it's like, man, I can just sing this all day long. It's like amazing grace to me. Isn't this wonderful? And, and I think God, if you look at where God is, I mean, just imagine yourself where God's at. And he's like, wow. I mean, I created this, this grace. I, I allowed for this grace to, to be able to happen because of what my, my son did. Remember, for God so loved the world, right? I, I sent my son because I love the world, not just you. And this grace is like a river, and it does flow, and it does funnel, but not just to you. You, you, you understand? Like, I care about the people behind you, too. And so it's a little bit, I think, from God's perspective, supposed to be more like a fireman's brigade, that, that yes, this, this water or this grace came to you, but the bucket's not supposed to stop there. It, you're supposed to receive it joyfully and gladly, but then you're, you're supposed to pass it on. You see, grace is supposed to beget grace. And if grace doesn't really beget grace, are we really understanding grace fully? And that's kind of the tension. Do we really understand the good news fully? Or do we just understand it as good news for me? I think that's always the tension. And we see that showing up in the book of Acts here. The people are going to the affinity group. And then these guys go to Antioch. And they reach out to the Greeks also. And, um, and so we took the name Antioch. This church did. This community um, and you name churches these days. In the olden days, uh, the Bible days, it was just the like church at Bend, right? Um, but now we name churches because we got lots of them. And that creates an interesting dilemma because now we brand churches. Okay, now there's a good side and a bad side to everything, right? Money, power, whatever it is. Um, it says in the book of Proverbs, to have a good name is, is, a, is, is a desirable thing. It's worth more than a lot of money. Because if you have a bad name, you can pay a whole lot of money and it's not going to erase the way people think of you. Does that make sense? So to have the good name in the first place is valuable. And so a name is really an idea of the thing. And that's really what a brand is. It's the idea. It's what people associate with you, whether a person or a company, a business, whatever it might be, right? And so when people say um, the Republican brand is in trouble, I've heard that a lot the last four years. What they're saying is, is that the idea of this thing, this political party, is in trouble because people, you know, the, you know what I'm saying? I'm about to go down a bad road. Um, but so when, when we name churches, we're creating a brand. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it, it can be a bad thing. Because all of a sudden, um, we, have, we have to ask the question, what is the brand really associated with? Is the brand really about itself? Or is the brand somehow... Uh, associated or the name somehow associated in people's minds with what the church really is in terms of being the body that sits underneath the head that is Christ, right? So we're followers of Christ. That's why we, we're Christians. I, I don't get into the whole Calvinist-Armenian debate because we, we begin to actually think that maybe I should more passionately align myself with like a sect of Christianity rather than Christ the head. And it changes the way I see people or my faith. And it's like I, I have opinions on that stuff. And they're not as important as the fact that I'm a Christian, a follower of Christ, right? And so that's what matters. Now, so the, the brand of a church, um, same thing. Churches are, are really a group or a community or a gathering of Christians with Christ as the head. And so just like a Christian, I can, I can begin to get high-centered on Calvinism or whatever that might be. As a church, I can begin to, to find myself in an institution that gets high-centered on its own competitive particularity. 
how it's doing vis-a-vis -vis other churches, how it's doing in people's minds in terms of being a success story, how it's doing in terms of representing a certain uh, set of traits that we like, but, but not necessarily really saying, at the end of the day, we're either a, a really healthy or accurate reflection of Christ, or we're, we're not. So what does that name or brand, what does that really represent? And is it the right kind of thing? So we named our church Antioch because we wanted to say first and foremost that we're a Christ-centered church. We're a Christ-centered church that is about taking the gospel to people, the good news to people, that it's not just about consuming or it's not just about us being individuals and somehow saying that religion is something I use in my game of making life about me. Do you understand what I just said there? That religion is not just some mechanism or thing that I use or utilize in somehow making life more about me. So that's an incredibly important thing. So that was the name and our first commitment at Antioch, that we'd be Christ-centered. The second one follows right out of that, that we would be people of grace and not the law. Because at this church at Antioch, when all of a sudden you have these, these Jewish folk and these Gentile folk, in that day and age, they weren't supposed to eat together. So how do you have a fellowship time with people who, by law, think they're not supposed to be fellowshipping together? And, and this interesting thing arose in the church at Antioch that basically grace trumps the law, right? That authentic spirituality, a spirit of Christ-likeness trumps tradition. And so somehow that's what unifies us. And, and so Antioch took that as our second thing, that we're not going to fight about petty things. That we're going to fight about relationship and community and love and how we could be together, that we weren't going to be divisive. And, and that was kind of the second thing. And then we went on to the third value at Antioch, which was intentional community. Um, Paul went all the way down to Jerusalem to basically fight for this, to, to get people to, to baptize or to acknowledge that their brand of doing the faith was in some sense this exciting um, ordained or, or blessed or spirit-infused way of reflecting God's heart for the church. That this kind of intentional community with a multi-ethnic, multi-cultural expression was somehow um, unique but also praiseworthy. And so intentional community um, it's going to be a hard fight, but Antioch is committed, very committed, to, to continually becoming more and more multicultural and multi-ethnic. Why do you think it's going to be hard? Because we live in Bend. <laughs> um, I would love to someday say that Antioch helped Bend become more multi-ethnic. I mean, I, actually, I, don't, I don't just want to say that. I'm subversively working toward that. <laughs> um, hiring practices, intern recruiting practices, Killens College, it's all a part of a grand scheme to be able to pull Bend into being more multicultural and multi-ethnic. Why? Because it matters. The plurality of voices matters. Um, the, the expression of different cultural backgrounds and what we can learn from each other and how that forces us not to get too comfortable with, with our own affinity group. That matters. And then lastly, Antioch's fourth commitment was to, to be missional. Now, missional is an overused word these days. It wasn't when Antioch started. But it simply means this. Missions isn't something that other people go do. Missional is a mindset that all Christians are supposed to have. That as a Christian, I am a witness. I'm either a good one or a bad one, but I reflect Christ somehow if I carry his name. And so we're all, uh, according to, to 1 Peter, we're all priests. We're, we're, all, we're all somehow in this together with this wonderful opportunity to be salt and to be light. And so that's a missional mindset. 
that we don't just get stuck in our affinity group, but that we, we love people outside of our affinity group. We speak to them. We bring them good news. We invite them in. We do all these kinds of things. So I want to flip over in Acts just a little bit to chapter 13. And the beginning of chapter 13 says this. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnab- uh, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod uh, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said this. He said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and did what? Sent them off. Off where? They just sent them off. Go. Preach. Um, Head west, (laughs) young man. Um, But I I can't tell you how earth-shattering this paragraph is to me when you think of the modern church. You've got a church community that's rather progressive. It's on the cutting edge of defining what the church is going to be. You have two very dynamic leaders here, Saul and Barnabas. I mean, you've got the senior pastor and the senior associate pastor. They're the ones that have the connection to the big kahunas in Jerusalem. They're the ones that are networked. They're the ones that are authoritative and and in some sense prophetic. They're the ones that are able to teach. Saul, after all, was a Pharisee, right? They're the ones that know the scriptures. And so here you've got these two guys and this church is growing and God's hand is with them and more are being added daily. And and so this thing is working, right? And I'm sure there's a whole lot of issues that have to be kind of played out and figured out. And so they go to a prayer service or a, a worship night one night and they worship and they pray. And then the very next day, what, what do they do? They give away or give back to God, or release, because it was never really theirs to to begin with, right? They open up their hands and allow God to take Saul and Barnabas and send them to continue the work of basically planting more churches. They take the best of what God gave them, and they're willing to give it away because of a prayer night. What church in America would go to prayer one night and the next day give away the senior pastor and senior associate pastor? What church in America is so missional or so others-centered or so gospel-centered or so the kingdom of God or the king, Christ, centered that they wouldn't look to their own needs but would look outward to the world, basically. Um, I, I don't see that a lot, the church in America. It's really a huge thing, and so we used to use that mantra that we want to reflect this. We want to take the best of what God gives us, and we want to be able to give it away. That we want to discipline ourselves to not become ingrown or self-focused. And so that's a part of the name Antioch. And so when, when um, we talk about this kind of vision statement idea that, that sounds very audacious and very whatever, um, to be an authentic expression of Christianity in Bend, Oregon, and to have a shaping voice in global Christianity, like sometimes I say that and cringe because people are going to be like, who do you guys think you are? Shaping voice in global Christianity, really? Um, what's up with that? You know, what, what happened to just love God and love others? You know, um, and, and so I cringe sometimes, and I, I've often cringed. And so there's interesting times like last week when the Justice Conference happens in L.A., and I look around and I see so many of my friends down there as a part of this movement. You know, I see Mary Lee, who's been doing registration since the conference was in Bend, um, and you don't want to talk to Mary Lee the week of the conference. <laughs> a lot of emails. 
And I see our youth pastor running around um, with speakers from all around the world uh, helping take care of them. And I see others doing different things. And, and I look at this and, and you hear the, the people talk about how that movement has, has been in some sense chosen by God to accomplish something in the church. To change the moral vocabulary of the church in the right kind of way. And as a pastor, I look back and I go, that's really crazy. A a group of friends um, have been able to be a part of something that is shaping the church in America or having a shaping voice in global Christianity. We have a former intern that went around to 10 different colleges with two other former interns. And, you know, we've had 160 interns from, I think, some 40 different colleges And everywhere they go, people have heard of Antioch. They've heard of this church. In 1 Thessalonians, it says this. Turn there if you want. Um, 1 Thessalonians 1 7. Uh, And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and uh, Achaia, and the Lord's message rang out from you, not only to Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. I don't know that that's a direct verse for, say, Antioch, but there's a sense in which um, a group of believers and their faith begins to leak out and other people know about it. And it's interesting to hear people that go around and and talk to different colleges and students and people have heard about Antioch and and that this is a place they somehow need to get to. And I meet people that say this or uh, of themselves, I somehow need to get there. I need to be a part of what you guys are doing. I need to see it. Or somebody told me I need to go there, I need to move there, I need to be an intern there, I need to something. And so it's, it's a really interesting thing for me to travel around and even to talk to leaders in the church in America and they know of this place. Jenny Yang from Mortal Leaf is going to do Redux. She travels all around the country um, talking about immigration and things like that. She knew of us enough to know to bring snowboard equipment so she could go snowboarding while she was here. Um, It's a a, a humbling, awkward, interesting thing. And so here's the tension for me that, that I've been sleeping with the last two nights. When I travel places, and one of the things the elders have done is set apart a, a good chunk of my time to be able to travel and to be able to, to go out and do not just part one of our vision, um, the local part, but to also be able to travel to do part two of the vision of Antioch and to be able to speak and to be able to learn so that when I come back, it's, it's not just what I bring or, or can say when I go places or others on staff go places, but it's what we can be exposed to and see and learn and then bring back here. So there's a value to it, right? But I go to places and here's the thing that happens. I, I oftentimes won't won't take a picture or put a picture on Facebook or Instagram. Sometimes I do, but oftentimes I won't. I'll go three days or whatever it is, and I'll purposely stay off social media. Do you want to know why? Because I'm afraid that someone in Bend that goes to Antioch is going to see that and that their response is going to be, why is he out there? That somehow someone's going to get mad at me because I'm not here meeting the needs exclusively of this community. Um, And here's my confession. That's a pretty crappy way for me to trust you guys. Right? That's what I've come to realize. That's a pretty lame way for me to operate thinking that the vision of this church, that somehow I get it, but not enough of you get it, so that I have to hide because I can't trust the church to celebrate that God is working both locally here and outside of here with what we collectively are doing. 
that instead of being able to see different things, hear about former interns going to intern places or, or other people on staff being able to travel or do something and celebrate it, that we're able to give gifts back to God, that we're able to steward, steward, uh, have a stewardship over the resources of our church, that we get to celebrate what God is doing there and enjoy that. Um, I actually think or have thought so little of some of the people in this church that I, I'll hide that. That's wrong. Um, and I'm sorry. Uh, I think... God is doing enough at this church that, that I don't need to shrink around anymore like, and, and be afraid. I, can we just celebrate what God is doing? Not that it's perfect, not that we're finished, not that we don't have tons of things that we need to still do locally as well as abroad, but can we just celebrate together that we get to hold this church with open hands um, and not make it about us, um, right? And so I've kind of begun to hate social media. Anyone else? Um, but now maybe I'll just do it for the sake of it because I've kind of said like I have to do something like that. Um, but there's a reason I brought this up, because that's not the only tension I feel. Like, I feel like there's this, t there's this tension about the two halves of the church, the half that's here and the half that's out there. And sometimes the half that's out there is less, right? It's Paul and Barnabas, and then later on, others that joined them. But the part that's out there is less than the part that's here. It's pretty natural. And so the, I think what I've been feeling is, is being afraid of that tension and feeling like it really creates two halves. Well, what solves, what solves that, the two halves? What solves it is understanding that this, this isn't our church. It doesn't belong to us that it's God's church, that it's Christ's church. It belongs to, to him. And we get to enjoy the Christian community. We get to benefit from it, surely. But we also bear this responsibility to serve it. And collectively, um, we're in this with no distinction or honor. Some people have certain gifts. Other people have other gifts. Some people play one role, other pe uh, people play a different role. And Paul will go to great lengths to say something funky is happening in the church when the eye makes fun of the foot or the hand and says somehow there are distinctions. Jesus' disciples fought with this. I mean, this is, goes all the way back to the forming of the church. Playing games about who's going to have the greater roles or the lesser roles and, and where the distinctions are at, right? Um, and so Paul warns about this. And then Paul literally got so frustrated. And I know this feeling sometimes as a pastor. I was telling my wife, like sometimes when I, when I go to speak, I want to use my whiny voice. I, I mean, I really, like in my gut, what would feel right to me is to use my whiny voice. Here's, here's also what I've learned. My whiny voice never really works well when I'm, when I'm preaching or teaching. Uh, it feels good, but it doesn't really work well. Um, and maybe that's a, a modern phenomenon because Paul used his whiny voice a lot. And it's in Scripture. Half of um, 2 Corinthians or a, a big portion of Thessalonians is Paul using, a, I think, his whiny voice and saying, you know, You've driven me to complaining and whining about how unfair my life is and all that. And you've driven me to do it, like he says to the people that are reading his book. And, and he uses this whiny voice. And then in the book of Corinthians, he also whines about, I shouldn't have to defend my authority. I shouldn't have to tell you that, that we're just all serving together. But what you've done is you've started to follow a personality cult. Apollos is cooler than I am. And he's got skinny jeans, and he's got, like, 
whatever the latest evangelical haircut is. And, and you're like, you're following after him. And it shouldn't be like that, says Paul. It shouldn't be like that. We've, we serve a function, but the function isn't for you to praise. We serve not to create followers. We serve to dignify the value that every member of the body has and that our function as leaders is to be able to make sure that we're able to bring health, just like parents maybe to a family, bring health amongst the different members of the body. But not to be put on a pedestal. I'm going to be very careful here because I wasn't going to do this, but now I am. Um, I, I, I typically won't say anything negative about churches, specific churches in America. I'm not going to say which specific church this is, but, um, but this is a big problem in America. So the, uh, I've got a, a friend who, who does call people out, and he has a blog, but there's a very big, powerful, well-known church with, with a pastor, and they, they had coloring pages for the, the kids' ministry. Um, and the coloring pages uh, said, we are united under the visionary. And then it has a picture of the cool um, pastor. And then it says, this church is built on the vision that God gave pastor so-and-so. And we will protect our unity in supporting his vision. Now, if I ever say, first off, if there are ever coloring pages <laughs> with, with, with me or Kip <laughs> in them, please run, okay? Second off, um, I've had a lot of conversations with you. I'm, I'm smart enough to know the role that vision plays in an organization. And if you've been at Antioch long enough, you know that I, I really try hard not to share vision. And sometimes I'll realize, you know what? People just need to know what the heck is what and what's going on and they're really confused and the lot I really need to share some vision. We'll come to like a worship night. And I'll be all like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to get up and share vision cuz I can share vision. Um but I really feel like God told told me really early on in this church that the vision is his the leadership ultimately is his. Um, just like in the Old Testament, it was the pillar of fire or the cloud and the Israelites followed that. And it wasn't just Moses that was able to see it. See, that's the interesting thing. It was everybody was able to see it. And they were able to unify under God's leadership for his church. And half the time, they didn't know where they were gonna go. If you drew it on a GPS, where God led them was completely um, nonlinear, right? And nonlinear vision works great if God's the one uh, leading, but if a, a human is going to lead, right, and be effective at it, it has to be linear. And it ha also has to be predictive. It has to go five years into the future, ten years in the future, and, and it has, everything has to coalesce around that vision. And then you get this really interesting thing where you're running full speed, and then all of a sudden, if God's really in control, God wants you to, to do a crazy Ivan. Kip got the joke. <laughs> but that doesn't work when you've got everybody heading in a direction and you've leveraged all your chips as a leader that God has told me we're supposed to do this and now everyone's moving and they've donated money to it and they're going and then all of a sudden God really wants to do something different. What do you do then? So I've tried really hard. So at these worship nights, I'll get up and I'm like, man, people need to know what's going on. That, like there is a plan <clears throat> and then I can't. I'll walk up and I just can't do it authentically in my gut. I cannot, I, I, it, I literally get physically sick if I begin to feel like I'm, I should do something with these people here that I don't really buy 
down here. Does that make sense? I literally begin to feel like this tension. I'm about to become dishonest, but they won't know that. And, and it's, pro- people, it's, it's probably good in the long run, but it's not honest. And so I've, I've tried really hard not to. So this is why. If we're going to find unity, it's not going to be because it's ego-driven. I, I, don't, I don't want that. It has to be Christ-centered. It has to start there. We have to all be able to see that even if it's nonlinear or even if it's all over the map, that somehow God's moving. You, we, can, we can judge by numbers, but frankly, you can have an atheistic business or even an atheist church that grows. And I don't think we're going to say, well, that growth is always an indicator of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, in Jude, and we're getting there now, like I said, I was going to do half and half, and that's what we're doing. Even in Jude, you're seeing Jude warn against false teachers that have gotten into the church. Heresy can grow a church. Growth is not always an indicator of health or that God is somehow vitally involved. Now, I think oftentimes when God is involved, you see growth, but it's not always that. And so we get left with this tension of how do we deal inside a church, in a community, also having influence outside a church and kind of in the world, but that these are somehow the right kind of things, centered in the right kind of way, and that we don't have to have them in competition, but it all works together. And here's the difference maker, that it's all under the headship of Christ. That Christ is so at the center that it keeps the local people not from being like, hey, we don't like the attention or the time going over there. And it keeps the people that are getting to go over here not thinking that somehow that's bigger than what looks uh, or shows up in the local expression of a church that incarnates itself in a time and a place because principles or teaching or influence out here, if it can't incarnate in a community, if it can't be shown to be healthy in a place called Antioch, Old Testament, or Bend in the New, uh, New Testament era. I'm sorry, New Testament, both of them. Um, yeah, um, putting a false divide there. But, but if it can't show up, these things are both needed, right? My body is interdependent. It keeps itself biologically alive. But it also exists. My hand is shaped this way. Because it reaches out into the world. It doesn't just send blood to and fro. It, it, it's interconnected and interdependent, but it also has a function outside. Everyone should have a ministry in this church because we're a body. But you should also have a, min, a, a mission in this world because you're a Christian who's a witness to the power and the authority and the, and the beauty of what a relationship with Christ can look like, and you go manifest that to people that need that message in this world. And that when a bunch of us begin to move forward in this world, there's a kingdom reality that changes our, our relationships, the interworkings of how society functions, and that somehow goodness comes about societally uh, in that. And people even see that of a bunch of people, and they say, wow, That Christ you talk about, I need to know more of that. Jesus says, they're going to know you're my disciples by your love for one another. By somehow what happens between you is going to manifest something so attractive and praiseworthy that people are going to come hanging around like, like, like moths to a light, right? And so Christ is what unifies both the ministry and the mission, both the authentic expression in in Bend, Oregon, and the shaping voice in global Christianity. Christ is what unifies us, not a person, not a leader, not a, a human vision, 
But Christ is what unifies this as we all look to him and are enamored with with him when we're all infused with that grace and that joy and that desire to serve, be known by, be around, and be with others who similarly are overwhelmed by this. That's when it's working right. That's when Antioch works right. In Jude, we see it working wrong. So here's what it says in Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now Jude was also a brother of Jesus. And in that day and age, you get authority uh, through the family. An honor with one is an honor for all if you're in the family. And it's interesting that he puts himself as a servant of Jesus Christ but then also as a brother of James, and he could have claimed more authority by saying who James was, but he's speaking to the the New Testament community in and around Jerusalem. They all know who James is because James is the leader or was the leader of that community. Uh, Jude, by the way, is believed to be the youngest brother. And so he writes, as a servant of Jesus Christ and as a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, he's writing to the church Mercy and peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. Stop for a second. I was eager. I was excited. I wanted to write to the believing community about the salvation that we all have. The good news that I was just talking about. The headship of Christ. That we're all together in this. That grace works itself out. That we know the joy of that fellowship. I was eager to write to you about that. But, he says, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. I'm urging you, I don't know if this is the whiny voice or not, but I'm urging you that you got to fight and contend for the faith because certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you and they are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And then he goes on, uh, and he gets to verse 11, and he says this, Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain, and they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now what he ends up setting up here is this idea that this is, the, this is the beginning of the New Testament church and you got this church community and it's supposed to be going this good way, right? The kingdom way. And people have gotten into it and they're beginning to lead people astray. And so Balaam's era and Korah's rebellion are things that happen in the book of Numbers when the, the Israelites were coming into the promised land um, and Balaam led some of them astray. And Korah's rebellion, Korah had ego, and he didn't like the positional authority that Moses and Aaron had, and he wanted more authority, that it was going to be about him, God, then him. And so he began to challenge their authority, and he took the tribe, I think Reuben, that was next to where he camped, because you can get to the people close to you, can't you? And he began to lead them into a rebellion and following him to challenge the authority that God had. And what Jude is saying is that there are people that are doing this to the New Testament church, that as this thing is coming into finding its, its, itself, as it's coming into its stride, like a runner beginning to run a race, as the church is beginning to gain its stride, some people are coming in and they're leading it away. They're undercutting it. They're chipping at the legs. They're, they're destroying or compromising the vision that God has for his church, for the body of Christ. And what ultimately is the message here that leads the church astray? It's people who think it's first and foremost about them and giving a message to other people that this grace or this religion is first and foremost about them. And this is done, Jude says, when you deny Jesus Christ as the sovereign. 
So you see the, the tension here. When it's working right, you have the headship of Christ that shapes and defines everything. When it's working wrong, we somehow make little of the headship of Christ and we make much of ourselves as the center of the attention uh, or the, as the center of kind of what's going on with religion. And grace no longer becomes about grace in order to have forgiveness, in order to have a relationship so that we can be with Jesus. But grace now becomes pure license that we can just do whatever we want. Turn to Galatians chapter 5 with me if you would. Galatians 5, Paul talks about the same thing. And he says this. You, my brothers, Galatians 5.13, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Your grace, the grace that gives you freedom is not for yourself. The grace that gives you freedom is so that you're not under the, the punishment or under the condemnation of sin, so that you can be set free, liberated. Not to be liberated, but so that in that freedom and in that, um, uh, that <laughs> I'm so articulate today that the synonym for freedom is freedom. Um, <laughs> But in that freedom, you're able to then go and look at others. And what do you do when you love others, when life is not just about you and you have freedom? You look at them and then you serve. You give. You reach out because the greatest joy is a we joy. It comes in us and it comes in community and family. And so now I have so I can go back. I have so I can give. And so I've been set free so that freedom isn't an end in itself. That's why every time I, I look at the news and I see Hollywood celebrities and I look at their life and I'm like, wow, how did you screw up your life so much with all that money and freedom? Right? Right? Because it's not an end in itself. Love is an end. Relationship is an end. Unity is an end. That's why Jesus, when he's praying in John 17, and this is like the end before he goes to the cross, he says, God, I pray that they may be one. I pray that they may be able to be one with us and one with each other. I pray that they're going to somehow reach the full measure of unity because Trinity and unity and community and love, because it's the nature of love to bind two things together, is it not? That, that all these things would work together. Those are ends. Freedom serves those ends. That's why you can have a happy person who works too many hours. You can even have a happy slave. It's possible. Ultimately, freedom, as wonderful and glorious as it is, is not the end. It's a means, it's a privilege, it's an opportunity. And Paul's saying, if you get this wrong and you think it's just about you, you're going to use your freedom to just go do what you, whatever you want to do. And then you're going to go, oh, I'm sorry, God, can you forgive me? Because then it makes me feel like I've hit the reset button. And as good Christians, we like to do that every now and then so that I can now go do more stuff. Because isn't this fun that I get to do whatever I want in life and that I can always just go hit the reset button? And Paul's saying, what is that? By the way, that's the Christianity that we peddle to teenagers. It's the Christianity that was peddled to me. Go sin. You can always, I don't know, convert whenever. When, you, when you've done enough sinning and then you're ready to move on to a more responsible life. Or, or you can get saved now and then just go sin. Because you can always confess it. Because God will forgive whatever you know, isn't that wonderful how great grace is? And it's like, no, that's not the message. It's not the, you've been set free from selfishness. You've been set free from that kind of dumb pleasure seeking that, that chases illusions and thinks that somehow cotton candy is going to satisfy. You've been set free from that, Paul says. And if you really understand grace, you're then going to use that freedom to serve one another. And the entire law, he says, is summed up in this command to love your neighbor as yourself. Grace that's divorced from Christ will always produce 
mere licentiousness. Grace that flows from Christ will always produce, necessarily has to produce, gratitude, adoration, discipleship, service. Antioch doesn't start with grace as our commitment first. It starts with Christ as our our chief commitment. And then the grace that follows, the community that results, and the mission that should emanate. Do you see that? And so Jude is saying, they deny, chapter 4, Jesus Christ is our only sovereign and Lord. And because of that, in this early church community, they're, they're beginning to lead people astray from the fruit of where God is trying to call them. And ultimately, what's doing that is this self-centered way of viewing religion. And I think this is epidemic in America. I confess it. I see it. I just think it's, I think it's so, it's the air we breathe. It's the air we breathe. We have to fight this. For us, I think in the church in America, Christ is the direct object in a sentence grammatically. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I screwed off during English in high school. Um, but direct object, right? It's like yada, 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 it's about Christ. Jesus. That's the direct object, right? Somebody. So that's, that's the direct object, right? The sentence? The yada, 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 yada about Jesus Christ. That's the direct object. So for us, I think we in our creeds make Jesus the direct object. Fair enough? Here's the question. In your life is Jesus the direct object? Here's what broke me um, this week. I asked myself these questions. I'm not going to tell you the answer because I care about image. <laughs> here's, here's some questions I want to ask you. When was the last time you, you prayed about Christianity on a global scale? That it would grow. That the message of Christ that he that he died for, the message of his death, that he, he died to be able to give birth to this man, that that, that would grow. When was the last time you prayed for that? When was the last time you prayed for the persecuted church, Pakistan or Syria or Egypt? People trying to hold on to this hope when there's no gain from it. When was the last time you prayed for Bend? The economic well-being of this town, not just your own economic well-being within it, when was the last time you prayed that Christ would do something amazing in this town? That, that a revival, because they happen every hundred years or so, that a revival would literally break out in this town and that it would be more than just um, cool worship music or cool trends or style. And I, by the way, that sounds bad. When I worship music, it's in the Psalms, Right? It's, uh, it's like a brand name. It can be a good thing or a bad thing. It's, worship music is in the Psalms. But I think sometimes in the church, we rip it out and make it so about us and our, our styles or our preferences or our emotions so that we can have an emotional experience that has nothing to do with Monday when we're, when we're waking up and going to work and we're not praying about our city and we're not praying about Christ being magnified in this town. And when was the last time... You or I, when was the last time we prayed about Antioch? I mean, really prayed, not just said it. Like, oh, I'm praying for the church. When was the last time we prayed for Bend High? We meet here. Do we just use this place? Is it so transactional? It's like, well, of course we use it. We pay rent, don't we? They owe it to us. You know, we pay custodial too, so I'm going to bring my coffee in. Or leave my trash? Or, or do we actually realize there's some kind of a dynamic we have with this school? We fill this place with praise on Sunday. There are Christian teachers that go to this school that also come here on Sunday. Do we pray for that? When was the last time we really prayed for Christ's agenda? So I, I'm not going to tell you how I did, but here's my conclusion. 
I think sometimes our prayer is a good litmus test. If we're praying, first. Second, what we're praying for. Because this church can be successful and it can be fulfilling the call that, that the head that Jesus has for this church even if you lose your job this week. Even if your husband or your wife divorces you. Even if you go through intense suffering. It doesn't make this church successful or not successful. Our own unique experience is not the barometer for analyzing this church. It's hard for me to think about because I want to sneak my own desires into it. Jesus can be Lord of this church. Health can be going on in this church. People can be meeting needs in this church. This church can be a light to this community. This church can be, in some strange way, exerting influence in the world. Don Jacobson and I, um, the first year of Antioch, had this kind of funny thing one night, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to pray that God could change the world through a little church in Bend, Oregon that's never going to be bigger than you know, a certain amount of people? And, and we were kind of like, yeah, wouldn't that be funny? But, but all those things can be happening and you could still have a horrible experience. Do you understand? Christ should be the direct object of our life, not ourselves, and somehow the religion is, is aiming at meeting that. Christ should be the direct object of this church not some guy or some human vision or any number of egos. So here's a really interesting thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. Um, I really don't want this church to be ego-driven, so I try really hard when I teach to really try to figure out not what I want to do in terms of shaping but what, what I feel like the church really needs to hear. Like I asked my wife, I'm miserable on Saturdays, okay? It really matters to me that it's authentic, okay? Um, if I get ego-driven, you become an agenda for me. This is why I really struggle with talking about money at Antioch. Because no matter how biblical it is, Jesus talked more about money than he did prayer. No matter how important it is that we educate on it, no matter how much I feel this urgency, because I hear the stories all the time of, of us, this church. We get hit up by asks from organizations and other churches. And we're a good group of people, so you know what we do? We give. When we're asked. And so I sit around like biting my nails and going, dang it, I should ask more. <laughs> because giving comes on the back end of ask, you know? And like, so even from a pragmatic sense, I think we should talk about money. But ultimately, if I got up here and I tried to give you my best sermon on tithing or giving, if I really tried to do a good job, you know what is really in my mind? In that message, it, it's the result, not you. And so every time I think about it, every time I'm asked to do it, I get sick to my stomach. And I don't do it. And this church that I think is a wonderful church, we struggle financially. And I've decided I don't want to ask people to give. I want to... I want to say that I'll die for this church and I want people that will invest along with me. That want to sign up online, that want to give even when you're not asked, that want to give above just the minimum, that really believe that God's doing something with us, with we, locally and globally, so that it will just come and we can depend on it. And we don't have to end up in February bottomed out again. 
I want to be able to cancel church on a Sunday because we need to show respect to this church, uh, this school, and not have to think about the 20,000 that we lost that's not going to come back in. But I have to think of those things because we, we have not built a stable giving community. But I can't do it. I, can't, I cannot give you that tithing talk. I'm going to hire somebody else to do it. <laughs> Next time you see guest speaker, you look out. He's, he's here with a mission. Um, I do that because I don't want me to shape the teaching of this church. Even if it might be in the long run, a good thing. If it's not honest, I don't want to do it. Now here's the thing. Let me flip it around on you. So now this it's on you now. What happens when you guys come in about your ego? What happens when you come in with your ego? You're going to sit there and you're going to expect things from me and from others and you're going to evaluate, and you're going to critique, and you're going to judge. And you're going to take the good, leave the difficult, um, take what works, take what fits, take what blesses, take what is a great emotional um, experience. And then you're going to walk out, and the minute you walk out of these doors, Yourself will dictate the next thing that yourself wants to or needs to go to in order to continue to be about self. And you will give no thought to this church during the week. You will not pray for this church. You will not really pray for the spiritual vitality of this city. And when there's a need to give, yourself will think of all the reasons why that would impinge on yourself the time, the resources the, that you don't have, and yourself will think, there's 500 adults here. Some other person will do that. Just like when you're included on one of those long string emails with like 50 names, we all know that we never answer because we're like, there's 50 other names. There's only one 50th of that that was coming to me. I can hide and so self will not respond to any of the opportunities to serve. Self will not get in a small group because, dadgummit, small groups are miserable. By the way, um, you can sign up for one in the commons. Uh, our small group starts up again next Sunday night um, because we, we got out of the blocks a little late coming off of Christmas. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, when are we going to admit the obvious that small groups are hard? They're hard for dudes especially. But that we got to make time somehow for, for trying to figure out what this thing looks like called church. I don't care how important you are. I mean, you know, Ben, because we're all entrepreneurial, I mean, everyone moved here from somewhere, which means you had to be upwardly mobile or work for yourself or work from home, right? So somehow... We're all narcissists, right? Um, so I know you're too important to create the time for small group. I get it. But you got to do it anyways. You got to do it anyways. We've got to be able to figure out what it means to live this thing out. Even in the hard stuff. Because if we can't figure out how to live this thing out, even in the awkward stuff, the stuff we can't make time for, or the weird person sitting across from us on a Tuesday night sharing about something in, in prayer time that, that really grates on us, if we can't figure out how to work that out under the, the headship of Christ, then we've got nothing to sell to the world, do we? Hey, Congo, you guys have really screwed things up over there. But Jesus is the answer. He'll help you forgive each other and, and learn to, to walk side by side. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Yeah, how'd that work out in Bend, Oregon? In the sunshine with the mountain. I don't know. I was too busy skiing. I don't know. There's a lot more fun people to hang out with than the Christians. I don't know. I never really committed to my church enough. Why? Because there's, there's too many good causes to invest in. I don't know, because ultimately 
Christ is the direct object of my Christian sentence and grammar, not my life. Um, I'm not going to head the justice conference anymore. I told World Relief that Aaron Lytle, who's been driving the whole thing since the beginning, she should be the executive director. Um, by the way, my wife helped co-found this church. You know, we get really weird about founder and stuff like that. Um, I'm the founder of Antioch. I planted it. Anyone that knows me and my wife knows that I would have broken the first 20 relationships that came along if she hadn't been there, right? So who really founded this church? <laughs> um, we do things with gender. I can be an executive director, but, you know. So anyways, um, Antioch's my first priority. Kilns is my first priority. Um, those are my first priorities. I'd love to see the Justice Conference continue. God's doing some amazing things. Um, I'd love to see other things continue. But this is the proof of the pudding. We, together, have to work this thing out. I hope you believe this, not just good causes, is worth your investment. I hope that when I give it to the offering time now, over $100,000 comes into the offering because one person here knows that they can write a check of 50000 That's a little bit dreamy. But, <laughs> but I believe it can happen. Um, will you invest in this with me? I commit to keep Christ as the head of this, period. I commit to it. It's not going to be centered on my vision. But will you commit to it with me? If so, maybe you'll just stand. I'll, I'll do a quick prayer here. Um, and then we can own this church together. Father God, we argue a lot about who gets it right, who gets it wrong with Christianity. And that's a bit funny to me because we're, we're 2,000 years removed and we, we think in terms of American culture and I bet there are, there are so many things that we get wrong. I pray you give us the humility to put our hands out to be teachable, to ask you to correct us that we wouldn't be arguing about our glory, we'd be wanting you to show up and prove your glory. Father God, may you be big in our thinking. May our actions reflect it. May our, our prayers reflect it. May the way we govern our time reflect it. Jesus, may you be the head of this church. If you ever stop being the head of this church, I pray you kill this church. Help us to make the most of every opportunity with the people sitting to our left and our right as we ask them to a fellowship meal after this service, with the needy people in this town that need our compassion, but, but more than that, they need us to dignify them by co-laboring with them to try to help fix some of the issues that might be keeping them in a place of suffering. Father, I pray that you would help this town become multicultural, not just this church. I pray that you would help us value the other, that we're not sufficient in and of ourselves, but that you saw fit to make many different kinds because somehow your beauty is reflected in that. Father, may your grace beget grace. May your grace beget our worship. May your grace make us want to obey, not sin. I love this church, Father. I pray you protect her. In Jesus' name, amen.